Hello there. Welcome back. In this episode, I'm going to be talking to my dear friend, Lucy Walsh. She's kind of a big deal. Um, we wanted to talk about her new book, but also about some of the stuff that she's been through, which is pretty intense. So I'm going to get to that in a second. Some of you may have noticed uh, on Instagram, I mentioned that I got um, some strikes for some things that were just insane, um, promoting violence when I was actually speaking against violence. And then for some reason, I was reported for, or the AI reported me for um, sexual content, which it wasn't. And I wasn't sure if it was an AI thing or if somebody was, you know, trying to like, you know, demonetize me in some way or take my, my Instagram account down. And then the same thing happened to Bonnie on two different accounts uh, on posts that had nothing to do with what she was being accused of. And then I realized, oh, no, it's not just AI. It's that we're being targeted. So it's, it's, it's an ex-Nixian person. Uh, we believe we know exactly who it is. Um, but it got me thinking that, you know, if this kind of thing is going to continue at some point, you know, I may get deplatformed. So um, what I'd love you to do is join my email list on my website, just in case this vendetta continues, which has actually been going on for years and years and years. So join my email list. That way I can always reach you and always find you. Before I forget, I'm also busy um, editing uh, the cult course. You may have seen my video, What is a Cult, or the podcast episode, What is a Cult? And those of you on social media probably know that I've been posting a bunch about it. So um, I took that course and I worked with a psychologist in, in looking at it through a psychological lens. Like, why do we get sucked in? Um, why do we stay? What are some of the things that happen to us? It's a course to really help people understand the process as it relates to narcissistic abuse, because it's pretty much the same thing. Um, narcissistic abuse in an intimate relationship is pretty much identical to what happens in a cult. It's just a lot more people are affected. And potentially the leader is crazier. So I'm busy editing that right now. It's, it's a monster of a course. I mean, just the videos alone are like seven and a half hours. Um, I should have that ready by the end of this month, I hope. Um, it's, it's really going to be an amazing course. So, so check that out. Um, I'll be posting about it on social media. I'll be letting my email list know. And then finally, before we get into Lucy, I do have a Patreon account. So if you'd like to help support what I'm doing, please go to patreon.com forward slash Mark Vicente, and you can support me there. All right. So let me get to my dear friend, Lucy. She's about to release her book. Let me read you a blurb. Lucy is excited to release her most significant project to date. Her book, Remember Me as Human, which comes out March 12th, 2024, which is a tribute to her family and a book of passion and love. It includes her grandparents' World War II love letters, her grandfather's battle with Alzheimer's, and a deeper look into the familial relationship, including excerpts of a life entangled in the Eagles' success. So her dad is Joe Walsh of the Eagles. No biggie. Growing up with her father on the road, managing their relationship through his sobriety, and the moment she realized he was famous. During their three-day nursing home interview, what began for Lucy as finding out more about her grandparents' World War II love letters becomes a much deeper journey of hard-to-ask questions and even harder-to-believe answers than Lucy could ever have imagined. It is a journey into her grandmother's offbeat world and her ancestors' tumultuous psyches to the very vortex of her own self-discovery. Man, I wish I'd written that. That's good. Lucy is best known for her work as an actress in film and TV series such as Criminal Minds, No Strings Attached, Mother's Day, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and more. Additionally, Lucy is a producer and singer who has toured internationally with Maroon 5. Holy shit. And aside from her new literary endeavor, Lucy is soon set to launch her newest podcast, Broads in a Bathtub. Man, that I gotta hear. Uh, release date, TBD. All right, so let's get into my amazing conversation with my friend, Lucy Walsh. Let me just say, I'm thrilled to actually be able to talk to you on this insane podcast of mine. <laughs> and I'm interested in, because we've known each other for a while now. One of these days soon, we're going to be like old friends. <laughs> right. Um, but I know, I know a fair amount about some of the stuff you've been through. And I assume we can talk about that stuff, yeah? Absolutely. That's why we're here. Perfect. Perfect. So before we get into the the journey from um, hell to, to, to your, your amazing resurrection at the moment, can you, for the audience, just give the audience a little sense of who you are and how you got where you are? Sure. 
Well, I have to start by thanking you for having me, Mark. And I have been such an admirer of your work for so long, well, long before we met. And I just appreciate you so much um, having this conversation with me and also as a friend that I've come to know. And you are right. Soon we will be old friends. We're in that middle ground right now. <laughs> Still getting to know each other, you know. Um, but I just, I'm so grateful that we've connected and it's meant so much in my life on so many levels. So I'm so happy to be here with you today. And who I am in a nutshell, I was born in Montecito, California. I was born into a musical family. My dad's a musician, my uncle's a musician, my grandparents are musicians. And I've always been a musician. It was never a question of what I was going to do when I grew up. I never had that confusion. I always knew that I just wanted to be a performer and a creative, and that's what I was going to devote my life to. I also knew that one day I wanted to write a book. So that's why now publishing my first book is incredibly special because it's been a lifelong dream of mine. But for a long, long time, I talked myself out of it because I thought you had to go to school to become a writer or you had to be incredibly smart. And I didn't, I never thought I was that smart. So it took me a long time of tiptoeing around that dream to finally approach it and commit to it. So growing up, I was all about the music and the performing arts. I danced as a ballerina for 10 years. It was kind of like, and I really thank my mom for this, whatever I wanted to do, she was right there to make it happen. And I see today that children are really overwhelmed with like 20 activities. I don't know what it is about this parenting generation, but they are running their children into the ground with the amount of activity these kids are having to uphold. I was never like that. I wanted to do the one thing that I wanted to do. It was one thing at a time. It was piano and it was ballet and that was it. And um, this has happened to me several times in my life where I have decided something at a very young age and then I went out and did it and executed it and then moved on. So I've had a lot of different chapters of, of things that I've been curious about in my life and I like to look at life that way. Like life is not an accumulation of everything you've ever worked for. I'm learning as I get older that it's all these beautiful different chapters that might be totally different from each other, but they are things that I'm curious about at the time. So, when I was 10 years old, my mom took me to see the Nutcracker Ballet and I saw Clara, the lead in the Nutcracker, and I pointed up to that stage and I told my mom, I'm going to be Clara. Get me in dance class. And she did. And I danced pre-professionally for 10 years until I booked that role of Clara and I danced Clara in the Nutcracker. Um, also, it happened when I was about five years old. I remember watching Gone with the Wind over and over and looking at Vivian Lee on that screen and going, that's me, I'm that, that's what I have to do. Mom, get me an acting class. And she said, no, you're gonna have a normal childhood. Yes, my dad was super famous, but she really kept me away from the world of fame. So I grew up somewhat normal. <laughs> but she said, when you turn 16, if you still want to get into acting class, then you can. And my 16th birthday, I handed her the phone and I said, get me in an acting class. And she did. And that was my beginning of becoming a professional actor. So I was always all about the performing arts and it just went from there. From straight out of high school, I got a record deal and was taken away by my music for a while touring all over the world. I've performed the biggest venues in the world. I've sung for presidents. I've, you know, done all kinds of really incredible things. And it's always, always been just because I'm pursuing what I'm curious about at the time, you know? Um, it's quite an interesting life when you live that way. I heard 
a rumor, maybe it was an interview you did, that you didn't know for a long time, like, who your family was in the sense that your dad was this big rock star and all this fame, that you were not aware of that for a while. <laughs> no, I was not aware of um of the i don't know how to how to say it i wasn't aware my dad was so famous um i saw him do things here and there on stage when i was little but quite honestly he was at a pretty low point during my childhood he was partying still he was living quite a crazy life he wasn't around me I saw him maybe once a year and it was usually supervised and I didn't really know who he was, but when he was getting sober and going back to work with the Eagles, I was 12 years old and my mom had always said, when you are ready to get sober, I will make sure that you have a relationship with your daughter. But until then, you know, there's going to be parameters. And she stuck to her word. And I remember the day that he went into rehab. I was standing in the kitchen listening to her on the phone with his bodyguard, Smokey. And she took me there. She took me to his bedside. And I started to spend a lot of time with him at that point. And I don't know why I would have been taken into a rehab facility. That seems like very intense for a 12 year old. But I just remember being by his bedside, like in a hospital bed and just kind of trying to piece everything together that was happening. Um, and that he had always had like this brown long hair and then when he got sober, he he chopped it all off and he died at platinum. And I remember being with him like out in public and kind of looking at him from across the room and just thinking, who is this new man? Like there's this new man in my life who's my new dad. And it's it was a, it was a good feeling. I was very happy. I could tell that he was happier, that he was healthier, that something good was happening. And we got so, so close during that time. And that's when I experienced his fame because he started working again. The Eagles had their first show back, which was a VH1 taped show. And I was there at the taping at Sony Pictures. And I was sitting in between Claudia Schiffer and Whoopi Goldberg. And I was just going, okay, okay, okay. My dad's on stage and these types of people are here. Wow, okay, this must be a big deal. And then the Rose Bowl show was one of their first big ones with Hell Freezes Over. And that was like, I don't know, I think 78,000 people or something. And I was watching up from one of the boxes and I remember the stage going dark and the band walking out. And the eruption of that crowd was one of the most shocking moments of my young life. Well, it was, it was the most shocking moment of my young life. And I just, I wasn't blinking and I just had like tears streaming down my face because my dad was on the stage and I'd never heard a, a, a sound like that. And to realize that that was for my dad really hit me hard. Not only that, but I decided that that's what I wanted for myself as well. <laughs> if my dad could do it, so could I. And it really kind of set me off to like, go get that myself. That's amazing. It was amazing because a lot of times your parents teach you what's possible. One thing I'm so curious about is this drive that you have. Like, how do you explain this immense drive because as long as I've, as, as I've known you you're so busy doing so many things you are so motivated w where does that come from that's a very good question mark and something that I'm really trying to talk a lot about to shed light on different aspects of that drive to be productive there's two two aspects to it well it's a double-edged sword the thing you got to be careful of is hooking into that toxic productivity 
that we've all had hammered into us by society and parents and God knows what else, but I'm learning to be careful of falling into toxic productivity, being defined by achievements, which we've all fallen into that trap and continue to on a daily basis. Um, I think there's also another aspect to being driven for me that quite honestly is like, I'm just outrunning my fear of death. <laughs> honestly, like if I'm, if I'm creating and in motion, I don't have to think about how terrified I am of dying. I think that's a really real aspect to, 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 to being so driven. Those things aside, the good part about my drive is that <clears throat> I just really like creating shit. I really like connecting with people and doing it through mediums that I am thrilled by. And that for me is singing and acting and writing. Uh, I just, fucking enjoy it. It is so exciting to me to be a part of, of, I don't even know what to call it. You know what I mean? Um, I've just always had that intense, like drive to, um, to just create shit. And that was really snuffed out by the narcissistic abuse situation. And I didn't even remember that I was that I was that way until I escaped that situation. It really snuffed me out for quite some time there. That's what I, I want to get to next is I want to talk about because as you know, some of the favorite topics of mine and some of yours are, you know, cults and narcissistic abuse. So could you share with the audience some of what you've been through that has, you know, sort of dimmed your light for a while? Yeah. So in 2010, I was at the point in my life where I was on tour with Maroon 5. I was opening for them. I was having the best time ever. Uh, and I'd been touring for like almost a decade. And acting had always been my first love and I had put it to the side because my music had taken off so beautifully. And I couldn't stand it anymore. I really, really wanted to be acting and I knew that I had to make a decision. So I chose to stop touring, which was hard because it was great money. It was a wonderful, incredible, exciting lifestyle. And I, and, I, and I said no to some really exciting opportunities that I kick myself for now, but we can't do that to ourselves. Um, but bottom line, I chose to stop touring and stay in LA and commit to my acting because I knew that I had to give it 110%. The great thing about growing up around the Eagles was I got to witness this incredible work ethic of the top band in the world going out there and making it look effortless. But I got to peek behind the curtain and see the amount of work that went into that, making it look effortless. And that's really helped me in my life. So if I commit to something, I'm 110% until I'm not. <laughs> and um, I did. So I, I just made that mental decision in my mind. I didn't really tell anyone that I was going to now become an actress the way I had always wanted. And uh, I was at a dinner party and I mentioned to a very successful man in, in the industry that I was an actor. And he said, oh, well, you must go to Gloria Gifford's class. And I took that as a sign because I had put it out there to the universe that this is what I was going to do. And here came the answer. 
And uh, so I, I went to an open class for an acting coach named Gloria Gifford. And I signed up that day and I studied there for 10 years um, until I escaped in 2020. And I don't use that word mistakenly. It was an escape because what Gloria Gifford really is, is a narcissistic abuser and her class is a high control group and it is all within the cult of Scientology. And I was abused there along with countless others over the last 30 years uh, for a decade of my life. And it was a real life or death situation and um, taught me many things. And that is a bit of you know, explaining what it was, but of course that is a book in itself. So I'm sure you'll ask me some deeper questions here yeah. to kind of unravel it. Yeah, because I mean, I, I, I know of your experience and I, I'm very familiar with the tactics, but I'd like the audience to understand, you know, what were some of the things, you know, what were some of the things, coercive things that she did to the students? And what was also the dynamic, the power dynamic that was going on? in that school? Man. The power dynamic was intense. I had never experienced anything like that before. I was the perfect prey for a narcissist like that because I was very unassuming. I was very hungry for love and support and I didn't see it coming. I did not see it coming until it's too late. So yes, you're right for listeners. It is, it is a, a tricky thing to explain, but we can pick it apart and I will continue to pick it apart uh, in the future. There will be a lot more on this topic, but for now, um, I will say that the abuse spanned mental, physical, financial, sexual, psychological, all of the above. And by the time you realize what's happening, you're so far removed from your self and so far isolated from your friends and family that you have nowhere to turn except the narcissist. And that's what happened to me. At a certain point, I didn't speak to my mother for several years. I had absolutely nobody to turn to. And I was completely under the thumb of the narcissist. Right down to asking her how I should answer emails. I didn't have a voice of my own. And that was a very, very gradual process. That took... At the beginning, there were red flags, of course, of course, because we're not stupid. We see the red flags, but I would say that there's, there's a real problem with uh, humans in general ignoring red flags. We've trained ourselves for so long because, because of trying to survive and get love from childhood. We've trained ourselves to ignore red flags and I saw them and I ignored them. They were very disturbing. Um, these are hard questions to answer. It's hard to have these conversations because there's so much to say. And I know you know this. Yeah, I think one of the things that people do not understand that you've touched on is this idea of like, well, why didn't you just walk away? That's and they right. don't understand that at that point, you're so isolated from your entire support system that, you know, that's, it's all you have. But, you know, going into an, an, an acting class, an acting school, to me, so I was in drama school for four years, very, very vulnerable. Very. And then the idea that the person that's teaching you that you've entrusted is, is being abusive 
um, must have been a very difficult thing to try to reconcile, right? Yeah, it was. And um, it really was. I, I, In the beginning, she's love bombing you, right? So she was very sweet to me in the beginning, but I saw her doing things to other people. And quite honestly, she has a lot of beginners in her class because you can you can pull one over on a beginner because you can justify anything as well this is what it takes and this is the way the ind- this is what you have to do to get an acting career and they don't know any better um and her method of teaching is like you do whatever it takes to get the actor to the performance that you want them to do And under that guise, she's able to abuse you within an inch of your life. And I am talking physically as well. There were times where I didn't cry in a scene the way I should have. And she had five girls line up and slap me in the face as hard as they could. She would have people, including me, crawling around on their hands and knees, begging for forgiveness in front of 50 people. And I learned a lot about bystander apathy because you've got a room full of 50 people and they're watching somebody on stage being absolutely wrecked mentally, physically, whatever it is. And nobody speaks up because that is how it works in these high control groups. You look to your right, you look to your left and everybody else is going along with it. So you don't want to be the one that speaks up because you're just trying to survive. You don't want to cause a problem because that is going to make you be the one that has to go up there and get railed, you know, and, 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 and the punishment that comes from speaking out in those situations is eternal. It never stops. And that's the last thing you want because you're just trying to survive. So you keep your mouth shut and it really creates this climate of isolation from each other. So yes, you're all in the group together, but nobody's talking. And there were many rules at the at the school about like not speaking to each other. You only speak to her directly about a problem. If somebody tells you something that you think is not good for them in their life, say for instance, oh, I went out last night and got really drunk and you know, and then they're not doing well in a scene today, you're supposed to go tell her that you have that information so that she can address it. And if you hold information from her that somebody else told you, then you're going to start making mistakes and fucking up because Scientology is all about that. It's all about, you know, oh, you must have committed a crime and done something negative or evil against somebody in the group therefore that's why you you know accidentally put that box over there instead of over there where i told you to put it just crazy shit man when you look back it's so insane it's so insane to even say out loud but at the time you're so deep in it that you're just justifying everything you see and everything that's happening to you you ingest it and you think oh well it must be something i did it must be my fault and let me tell you that's why i was a perfect candidate because i had had a lifetime of thinking that way when my dad was leaving all the time when i was a child i decided that it must be my fault that i wasn't good enough for him to stay what did i do wrong if i could just figure it out then i could get him to come back then i could make him love me you know these are abandonment issues that really shape us as adults and make us very susceptible to narcissists and predators more so than than someone who doesn't have those issues But I quite honestly think that all humans have these issues, which is why we are all susceptible, which is why you can't look at each other and say, well, why didn't you leave? I never would have done that. Oh, yes, you would have. And get down off your high horse. It's not me versus you or they versus us. This is a universal issue and it needs to be talked about. And that's why I'm here. And I'm and I'm here to say that there's a huge life waiting for you on the other side of this, which you're told there's not. 
Yeah, exactly. And I want to get to that. But before I do, I, I want to just tell the audience that um, I'm going to put in the show notes the article. I think it was Hollywood Reporter, right? It was a Hollywood Reporter article? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to put in the show notes uh, the link to that article. And from reading that article and speaking to you and others, I started to get a picture of, of an acting school that was sort of like a kingdom um, where the queen was on top extracting obedience, you know, fealty and fuel from everybody. And it seemed like there was a lot of... Um, control at, at minimum, but, but sadism as well. Yes. And I was wondering, do you mind just sharing some of the kinds of things that she would do just to get the audience to understand what some of those things were? Yeah. After I escaped the situation, I was asked to be a part of a cover story for Hollywood Reporter shedding light on the abuses at the Gloria Gifford Conservatory. And some of the things that were mentioned in the magazine, which was only 2% of what we told the reporters, but of course, you know, that's the media for you. They're only gonna print the safe stuff. But what went on there was far worse than what was printed in the article. Um, for instance, and this is minor, this is minor. Uh, a girl wasn't reacting in a scene the way that Gloria wanted her to. So she took chocolate cake and she covered the girl's face with it and smothered her, choking her with chocolate cake. Humiliation, a lot of humiliation. Like I said, I was made to crawl on my hands and knees and beg her forgiveness for disobeying her. Um, there was one situation that had a very sexual edge to it. And this is where I do believe, I mean, a lot of sexual abuse went on there. Um, she has a rule that you're not allowed to sleep with anyone in class. You're not allowed to be romantically involved with anyone in class which of course doesn't work, but <laughs> um, especially because when you're in a high control group, those are the only people you spend time with. So one woman in particular was really in love with a guy in class who is gay. And Gloria always said that being gay was a choice because you're angry at your parents. And she was trying to turn this man straight. And her bright idea was to give this girl a free pass to sleep with this man. And she ordered her to go to his house in a trench coat with nothing underneath. And when he opened the door, she presented herself to him and tried to sleep with him. And he was mortified and told her, you know, I, I'm, I'm not in that place. And it backfired, of course. And the girl was upset and the guy was upset. And Gloria enjoyed the hell out of that situation. And there were many like that. It seems like a very <laughs> strange thing to, uh, to, to orchestrate there, but that was common. There were a lot of very twisted little plots going on at all times. Um, Gloria is driven everywhere by people in the class. I was one of her drivers for a long time. And when she, arrives at class, all the men have to be waiting outside to escort her inside and carry her things. And then everybody inside is standing and applauding when she walks in. Um, there were a lot of fines that were completely illegal. Um, you would get fined for anything from showing up late to not watching the class movie that had been assigned to talking back to wearing the wrong clothing. Um, 
fines of up to two, three hundred dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, fifty dollars. And this all went to Gloria and it was all cash and there are no receipts. But the Hollywood Reporter wouldn't touch that because of their legalities. Um, there are quite a few potential lawsuits that we could gather here if we so desired. And um, the money that was spent was extraordinary. People took out credit cards to pay her for a year of class at a time. People were starving and not being able to pay their rent because of their class fines. She charged for being in the plays. So at any time, at any given time, monthly with class and being in the plays and the fines, you could be paying thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars. And it's very common. 25 of us came forward to speak on the record for The Hollywood Reporter. There are hundreds that were on the list of victims and many were not willing to come forward. Uh, and many of those people spent over $100,000 with their time at Gloria's school. Um, most of that money is, is not documented. From everything that I have read and you know the people I've spoken to, the way I perceive her now is somebody who's very bombastic and very arrogant. Yeah. And somebody who seems to take no accountability. So what what has been her response to all the allegations? <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, in true narcissistic fashion, she has ticked every box of how they respond when they are outed. First of all, she was more than happy to speak with the journalist at The Hollywood Reporter to tell her side of the story. And I'm really glad that she did because it was insane what she said. It was absolutely insane. Uh, she really supported everything that she was being accused of. She played the victim. She made it a race issue. She said that it was a uh, white versus black thing. It was, you know, a, an angry white girl going after the elderly, disabled black woman. When I'm not even the one that went to the Hollywood Reporter, if she wants to know the real truth, it was actually somebody of color. So there you go. Um, she said that she was sick. She said that we were trying to kill her. She said that we were trying to harm her students and ruin their lives, and that her only concern was protecting them. Um, and then she unleashed a massive smear campaign against me in particular, she sent a letter to people in the industry about me, smearing me, which they told me about. <laughs> uh, it was very funny to read. I actually might share it sometime because it's a fascinating look at what a smear campaign from a narcissist looks like. And I think it's very educational. She not only smeared me on, and continues to, on a public level, but within her class. You know, whoever speaks up becomes public enemy number one. I heard her do it about people in the past. I heard her do it about people that I've now become close with. And when you start to meet the narcissist's past victims, you can piece things together because you realize you all have the same story. And Patty Jenkins was one of those people for me, the incredible director, Patty Jenkins. Gloria always hated her and smeared her to all of us constantly because she had taught her in one class at AFI and then made it seem like she was responsible for all of Patty's success. Um, and I've gotten to know Patty now and we have a good laugh over it, but that's what's going on for me. And it was really interesting when I escaped, Gloria began the smear 
to her class about me. And there were several others who left after me because of what she was saying about me. They didn't agree with it and they told her that on the way out. They didn't like it and they were fed up because a huge percentage of class time at the Gloria Gifford Conservatory is spent on smearing past students. And that's not what you're paying for as an actor. You are working your ass off to make this money to go to acting class and you're sitting there having to listen to these narcissistic rants and it's evil. It's completely unacceptable. That person should not be an acting teacher. So let me let me guess you were you were cast as the suppressive who didn't have what it takes to be a great actor probably. Exactly right. I didn't have what it takes. I couldn't stand the heat and that leads me to talk about the recovery, which we may not be there yet, but I believed that for a long time and that's what kept me there so long after I decided that I needed to escape to save my own life because I really was headed towards suicide. I tried to leave several times and if the narcissist can get you face to face, they can talk you back in. And so when the pandemic hit and I knew that the theater had shut down, and I actually had literally an escape, I took it. And, um, but it didn't mean that I was, I was still afraid that what she was saying was true, which is if you leave the narcissist, your life is over, you're a loser, you didn't have what it took, you're a failure, you'll have nothing, all of that. It took me a good, a solid, year to get over that and i'd like to share with you how it happened because you're involved oh well i want one more question before we go to that just one more thing i want to because i want to make sure the audience really understands there's tough love that happens in an acting class and then there's abuse yeah and how do you explain to people like this wasn't tough love? This wasn't tough love that built you up. It was something else. There's a major difference between tough love from a coach, which I've had and I appreciate from past coaches in my life. And then there's something different, which is what Gloria is, which is a narcissist bleeding dry everyone around them until there's nothing left. And if they take that person's life, they don't care because they would never see it that way. And that's what this was. And if you stay, you will be bled dry until you're dead. I was dead on the inside. I was prime, 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 prime for her to prey on. And I, um, I really needed to save my own life because I wanted to drive the car off the road at a certain point. And that's the difference with a coach who's giving you tough love because they want you to get to that finish line. You don't feel that way. You feel inspired. You feel supported. You feel excited about life. You don't have your freedoms taken away. She was controlling who I dated, what I ate, what I wore, and they brainwash you to the point that you are acting. It's so strange. How do you, how do you say this? For instance, When I had my Mother's Day premiere for Gary Marshall's film, Mother's Day, it was at the Grauman's Chinese Theater. It was a big deal for me. It was very exciting. My first feature, you know, big role in a feature with Julia Roberts, the whole thing. This is the reason I'm giving this example is because this is not what a tough love coach does in your life. Okay, but this is what was happening daily in this situation. She said to me before the premiere, don't invite me, I don't wanna go. If I go to one student's premiere, I have to go to all of them. You go have fun. 
So I said, okay, great. So I invited my mom. Gloria said, what are you going to wear? And I know because Gloria's done this many, many times where she rips women in her class apart for what they're wearing. She calls them up on stage. She makes the men comment on what they look like in that dress. She, she body shames constantly. And I didn't want to go through that. So I know that Gloria likes her women to wear these Chinese dresses. We always wear them at our plays. She always has everybody in matching uniforms, Chinese dresses that you have to buy yourself. And I thought I am not going to go through a fight with her about what I look like in a dress because she'll rip me apart no matter what, just because she likes it. Like you said earlier, there's this like, there's this enjoyment to things. So I'm just going to save myself the trouble and wear a Chinese dress. And if you Google pictures of me at that premiere, I'm in a green Chinese dress. And that was to escape a confrontation and a problem with the narcissist that was controlling my life. Now, she didn't have to have that conversation with me, but she had brainwashed me to the point where I knew how to make certain moves to avoid a confrontation with her. And that's what happens. The narcissist doesn't even have to do things anymore because you are now functioning like a robot to escape being killed. So that was that. The other side to that was I went to the premiere with my mom. We had a wonderful time. Gloria has a massive issue with mothers and she isolates everybody from their mother so the next day in acting class she calls me up in front of everyone and she says i will never forget that you took your mother to your premiere instead of me i will never forget that you have given me that fuck you that is a major fuck you and don't think i'll ever fucking forget it you chose your mother over me when i'm the one that worked you to that acting success and I said, um, I'm, you told me not to invite you. And when you try to call a narcissist out in front of people, they shut you down really violently. And that narcissistic rage comes out. And she wouldn't let me speak. And the narrative was going to be what she wanted it to be, which was a punishment because I hadn't invited her <clears throat> instead of my, my mother, when I knew damn well that she had told me not to invite her. And that's just one of hundreds of examples of that happening on the regular. So you become so confused within yourself and you're so far gone that you literally think, fuck, well, maybe I misunderstood. Maybe I misheard her. Maybe I heard it wrong. Maybe I got it wrong. It must be my fault. Going back to the childhood limited belief that you came up with when you were five and weren't getting the love you needed. It's all this vicious cycle and they just prey on it for as long as they can until hopefully at some point you've had enough. And that's the only way you'll escape is when you decide I'm done because I'm not crazy. Exactly right. Exactly right. So tell me about um, your sort of wake up and you said that I helped you. You helped me immensely, Mark. You were a part of what saved my life. And I talk about it in those terms because it's that serious. So my wake up had been gradual over five years. I had tried to leave several times from 2015 to 2020. But every time I had tried, she had gotten me face to face and I wasn't strong enough and brave enough to do it. So I had been pulled back in. But I was working up the courage to leave when I finally did in May of 2020 for a solid year before I did it. And COVID was the biggest miracle that I ever could have hoped for because it gave me that physical window to escape, which is what I needed. She shut the theater down and classes went to Zoom. And even then it took me four months into the pandemic to finally gather my courage and make this break. Now I can't explain to the listeners, I know you understand Mark, because you've been through the exact thing that I've been through. I can't explain to you the amount of pl planning that has to go into making a break from this situation. The amount of planning is what took me time. I didn't have anyone to turn to. 
I had no money. I wasn't paying rent. I was borrowing money from everyone I knew. I wasn't working. I didn't have a job because she made it so hard for people to keep jobs in there because you were required so much at the theater. So anyway, I also, aside from all the logistics of where my life was at that point of the abuse, mentally, I believed what she was saying, that you would die if you left, that you would never make it, that you were a failure. And my biggest fear was being that failure and not having been strong enough to make it through to my dreams. So when the day came, I sent the email, which I had written about a week earlier. And once you send that email to escape, everybody starts reaching out to you like the officers in class. And I know people don't know what that means, but it's a Scientology setup where Scientology is run in ranks, just like if you were on a ship or in the army. And Gloria's class is set up the same way. So she has officers. I was actually a captain, um, which is below an officer. And everybody has different roles. Somebody takes roll call, somebody takes payments, somebody blah, 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 all these different things. And um, the minute you send that email that you're leaving, all the officers start reaching out to you. And so I was prepared for all that. And you're basically hit with a tidal wave of resistance and trying to get you back in. And that happened to me. I got messages from all of them and I, I had texts that I had written out to send to them. Immediately after I sent that email, I sent texts to all the officers. Hey, I've left class. You know, thank you so much. I, I'm so grateful for everything I've gotten. I don't want to be an enemy because when you leave class, no one's allowed to speak to you ever again. And uh, you're an enemy because everything in a narcissist's mind is the enemy, right? The enemy versus me. And anyone on the outside of anyone coming at you or leaving you as the enemy. And so I was prepared for all that and it happened and it was very intense. And I still, I didn't tell anyone in my life that I had left because I was still defending Gloria for months. I was still defending her. Oh, you know, don't say that about her. She's lovely. I just, I couldn't cut it. You know, it's me. It, it's me. I'm the one that didn't want to be there anymore. Still believing that it was me until... I saw your documentary. Now, if I may go on a very short tangent about how I came to that, backing up to January of 2020, a man came into my life named Will Sweeney. And I knew that I was going to be with him in a very serious way. I, I felt that I wanted to marry him. And I, and I was still in class at this time. It was still four months before I left. I knew that I couldn't stay in that situation and be with this man in a truthful way. I couldn't have both because she would never allow it because she was controlling everyone who was in my life. And I wasn't going to let her do that here and I wasn't going to lie to him. So I knew that I had to choose and that was a major catalyst that gave me the courage to leave. And so, I still wasn't honest with him about what was going on. It came to May, it came to later that year. He still didn't know the full story. And he was saying something about Scientology one day and I got very defensive and I was crying and I was freaked out and I felt afraid because this man was like bashing what I had believed in for 10 years. And I told him, I was truthful with him. And he said, okay, he said, well, maybe I'm wrong about Scientology, but I would ask you, I will watch, you know, things, whatever you want me to see about Scientology, maybe I'm wrong, but I would also ask you to see what I've seen, which you're not allowed to do when you're in the high control group. You're not allowed to watch anything that might say anything bad about Scientology or the narcissist or anything like that. So you're not even, you're listening to no one on the outside. And I watched Leah Remini's documentary 
And I cried the whole time because it was my story too. And that's what led me to the vow. And that's what led me to your documentary. And when I saw that, I knew I wasn't crazy because you, your story was my story also. These were the same experiences. This was the same abuser. They're the same. It's the same animal. It's no different. And I reached out to you and I reached out to your incredible woman, Bonnie. And I told you guys what I was going through and you lovingly embraced me and welcomed me into the fold and gave me a foundation that I desperately needed to heal. And that's when I woke up and I stopped defending her and I took a real look at what had happened to me and I started to speak out. But it was a while before I was willing to really take a look at it. And I and I, I, I healed my bonds with my family members. I started speaking with my mother again. I healed everything. I got a job. I got back on track. I started to pick my life back up. I married Will. He has been the most incredible support to me while I go through this healing. And I am just coming up on four years out and I feel like I am just now getting to the point where I can go deeper on it and it's a daily work you know it's so hard to heal from this because you are unraveling years of lies from your own voice and it's hard to know the difference sometimes and I have many many situations where I where I have to stop and go Okay, I don't know if my feelings and my thoughts right now are my truth or if that's something that's been abused into me. I gotta, I gotta think about this for a second. And that's very confusing and scary, but it's people like you in my life, Mark, and the work you continue to do that help me in those moments remember that I am not crazy. I went through something that was life or death and and it's okay. It's okay to speak about it and be truthful and to take the time I need to heal. It's not going to happen overnight. And you're living proof of that and I'm living proof of that. And it was only after that escape that I could even take a look at my book work. And that's, you know, what I'm here today to really discuss is my book. But I had started writing my book before I joined Gloria's class. I started the book in 2010 and I joined her class in 2010 and it wasn't until 2021 that I even had the mental capacity to finish it and also I couldn't have while I was with her. I couldn't have done any of my own projects because you weren't allowed. You were not allowed to do your own projects. I had to be available 24 seven to that narcissist and that, that high control group. I couldn't have, I would have gotten roasted. I would have gotten, you know, punished and, and, and just, it wouldn't have been possible. So it was from the escape that I have now gone on to have the full life that I have today. I'm, and I'm so happy for you that you have that now. And you know, you're right. I mean, it gets better and better. So I'm coming on seven years out. And the, 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 the difference every year is, is remarkable. But yeah, I want to talk to you about your book. And, and I think you're right about you wouldn't be able to do it inside there because the, no. what I'm hearing about the book, it sounds like there's such um, e emotional depth to it that you couldn't have done it in there. But yeah, talk about the book. Talk about this incredible thing that you're about to release. Thank you. Yes, my book is called Remember Me as Human. And it publishes on March 12th. In a nutshell, it came about because when I was 17 years old, my grandmother Wanda, my mom's mom, gave me 63 of the remaining love letters that my grandfather Dale had written to her during World War II. They were separated for three years from 1943 to 1945, and only 63 of these letters remain. And I knew at 17 that someday I was going to make them into a film. 
And I felt that I needed Ron Howard to be the one to do that. So I would literally carry the letters around in my purse in case I ran into him because I didn't know how else to get into Hollywood yet. Uh, in the meantime, I started asking questions of my grandparents about the letters and about their life to find the story that was going to be the film. And through that process, my grandfather Dale died of Alzheimer's before I really got a chance to speak with him. And that really scared me because everyone, all of his memories and stories were gone suddenly and uh i didn't know where that was going to happen next and that really pushed me to take the project really seriously and uh it led to me interviewing my grandmother when she was 97 years old in her nursing home for three days about her life and i did that on camera so i have this gorgeous footage of her which i plan to turn into a documentary but the book is a, is the book is the story of those three final days that I spent with my grandmother, and she died four months later. That's incredible. I mean, what was what was that li what was that like? What was it like sitting with her? What was it like sitting with her and just and and listening to those stories? It was it was life changing sitting with her, and in that way, this book is. A personal memoir for me it goes in and out of my life and my experience of what that was like it goes in and out of her life it goes in and out of the letters it goes in and out of my experience of being at her nursing home and that's an intense experience i many of the listeners have spent time in nursing homes and some of you haven't but it's not easy to see people sitting in a corner with no visitors just kind of comatose and you know there's a whole life inside of them and i write about that a lot in the book and i'm actually partnering with an organization called the national association of long-term care volunteers and what they do is they are on a national level they help bring volunteer companions into nursing homes to spend time with the elderly popular you know communities reading playing cards talking whatever playing music people need companionship because loneliness is a real pandemic in the world and it it kills loneliness really kills and I'm very passionate about being a companion in nursing homes. I've always done that type of work in my life with various organizations. And if you wanna get involved and be and volunteer in your community, you don't have to go anywhere. There's a nursing home down the road that you could walk into today and say, hello, I'd like to sit with someone for a half hour and read them a book or listen to them or whatever, ask them questions about their life. There's a super easy training program that you go through through the organization I'm involved with. So please reach out. You can DM me or get in touch. It's really easy to get involved and to go do that. But anyway, that aside, sitting with my grandmother was fascinating because like I say in the book, what began as asking letters, asking questions about the letters became a masterclass in truly living and what it means to be human. And I learned a lot about being human through that interview with my grandmother. I saw a lot of things in her at 97 years old that I hadn't expected someone at that stage of life to feel. Like, for instance, there were some tough questions I had to ask her about things that have happened in our family. And she did not want to face it, man. And I saw, wow, I expected her to like, you know, have this gush of emotions and have this epiphany about things. And she was set in her beliefs about things. And I really not to, that's not a judgment of her in any way. It actually made me feel a lot of compassion for humans and for her, because I saw how, how much we have to kind of twist the details of the past so we can live with things sometimes 
it's very hard to live with difficult things that have happened to us. And I saw that we we kind of embellish and fantasize about things to 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 get through it. Um so that surprised me. How did the experience of sitting with her and writing this book, how did that change you? Sitting with her and writing this book. Finally connected me to my humanity in the sense of for a long time I was trying to be something other than what I am in this very moment so that I would be lovable enough, so I would be worthy enough. And by exploring what it means to be human through writing this book, I feel that it has really given me a new understanding that I am enough just as I am in this very moment. I don't have to achieve anything or be anything different or put some filter on my face to be loved. And the right people will love you no matter what. And I've really come to peace with that through this writing process. And I can look back on my life and see how the experience I was born into of having a famous father and thinking that I needed to be famous too to get his love, that's perfect for delving into this, this topic of being human. And I write about that in the book. I've gotten to see the insides of, of, of the most famous people in the world, and they're no different from you and I. I have a very unique viewpoint regarding what it means to be human because of having been born into that situation. Going through the Gloria Gifford abuse, I can see now that that was a situation that taught me about what it is to be human. So I don't think looking back that that was an, was an experience I needed because I had decided I was gonna be an actor. Like I told you, I had decided and then somebody mentioned the class. I don't think I went there for acting purposes. I went there to learn about that particular aspect of being human because I've been to the depths of hell with giving my autonomy away with allowing somebody else to think for me. And I never again will allow that. Never again will my freedoms be taken away. And I know what true freedom is now. And I didn't know that before, Gloria. And so you look back and you go, oh my God, everything I've been through has been leading me to be able to sit here and pass this information along and help someone else and, 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 and help people connect instead of feeling so isolated. And to be honest, in years past, my life was completely focused on acting and I felt like I would die if I didn't book acting jobs. Quite honestly, I feel so much more driven, haha, <laughs> driven, to do what I'm doing here, which is have these conversations, talk about these things that we all think we're going through alone. And Writing this book was a big way for me to do that. I feel that this book is an important read for everyone. I don't say that as like having any kind of ego as the author. It's a story that's far bigger than me. And I and I feel like it's it's come to me, you know, in a way. There's a lot of things in the book that I don't know how the hell I came up with it, but but I do know that our humanity is what makes us all the same, and we need to connect on that. And that's what I hope this book does. That is a very, very powerful message and very, very necessary. So just, just one last thing. Um, how can people find you and where can they buy your book when it comes out? Everybody, please follow me. Join the circus at The Lucy Walsh on all the socials. Uh, just... You know, that's where we can keep in touch. That's where all the exciting things are happening. The Lucy Walsh. My book, Remember Me as Human, is available for pre-sale on Amazon and publishes everywhere books are sold on March 12th. 
And I just really want to drive home the fact that I'm here today to share about the book and to share about what I went through with a narcissistic abuser because there is life after the narcissist. There is a huge life waiting for you. And don't worry about what they say. They're, they're lying. It's a scare tactic. Don't let them scare you. You have everything waiting for you on the other side of that escape. And I just wish you all the love in the world because you need it. If you're in that kind of situation, you need love and to know you're not alone. And I'm living proof because the best is yet to come. I'm doing fabulous things in my career. I met the love of my life. My relationships are better than ever. I am thriving. And I did all that through leaving and healing. And that's a big commitment, but you know what? We're worth it. I'm worth it. You're worth it. So just do what you got to do and reach out. Let's talk. Just like Mark allowed me to reach out to him, you know, reach out to me. You are worth it. You're worth it. We're worth it. Keep reaching out. You're not crazy. Lucy, thank you so much. I really appreciate this Thank chat. you so much, Mark. This means so much to me. I'm so glad we did it.